Well, we have had a busy day around here. Uh, we call these the 20-minute chairs, but we're not going to hold you to that tonight, <laughs> Dr. Parker. <laughs> we've heard student papers. We've eaten theological chili. We've just had a magnificent day uh, in Symposium Week. I want to welcome uh, retired faculty in our midst, esteemed uh, friends, want to welcome those of you for whom this is your very first time on campus, perhaps as a new student or an old one who just didn't get here yet. We're just happy, happy that you are here. And the peanut gallery back here, let's wave at them. All right, all right. That's the, that's the Greek chorus in the back, and they'll, they'll join you in amen when appropriate. This lectureship in biblical studies honors Henry Gustafson, an early biblical scholar here. He was a graduate of Yale and a graduate of the, of the University of Chicago. And it is said that his biblical teaching was so inspiring that many wanted to study the New Testament even as he taught it. We are very grateful to have Dr. Angela Parker here tonight, and the dean will introduce you in a moment, but I want to wave your book around because I have read it and he has not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you may borrow mine and it's carefully marked, Kyle. If God still breathes, why can't I? Black Lives Matter and Biblical Authority. I think the first chapter is probably my favorite title of the bunch. Stifled breathing. I was trained to be a white male biblical scholar. I don't think it took, sister, and I'm grateful for that talking about, but talking about the shape of the academy, much like Willie James Jennings says in his book, After Whiteness, what were they trying to prepare me to be? A self-sufficient white male. Well, thankfully, biblical studies are being transformed by persons like Dr. Parker. And we're so grateful that you're here. These are the best people in the room. We've got board members, we've got alums, we've got friends, we've got staff and faculty, people who love this school and who give themselves to it. We're actually the best thing north of Atlanta, so you, ca <laughs> you, ca you carry that word, you carry that word, you carry that word back. Welcome to all of you this evening, so glad you're here. Kyle. Well, <laughs> I haven't read your book yet because I've been waiting for Molly's version with the notes that she, to help guide my reading. <laughs> Now I know what I'll be doing later tonight. <laughs> it really is my honor and privilege to introduce our speaker, Dr. Angela N. Parker. For those of us who've had the privilege of being with Dr. Parker already today, what a delight she is to be around, what a joyful spirit, um, what a uh, intellectual mind, and we're in for a treat this evening. I don't have to read all of this, I don't think, because you have one, but I will just note that Dr. Parker received her BA in Religion and Philosophy from Shaw University, her MTS from Duke Divinity School, we heard a little bit about that <laughs> earlier, and her PhD in Bible, Culture, and Hermeneutics and New Testament from Chicago Theological Seminary. And Dr. Parker is now professor at McAfee School of Theology. Join me in welcoming Dr. Parker uh, to speak with us, to us this morning, this evening. Thank 
you so much, friends. I have been delightfully entertained. I have had wonderful conversation. The hospitality of your president, Molly Marshall, and your dean, Dr. Kyle Roberts, has been all extraordinary. And your faculty, your, your chorus in the back, thank you all. And I just really appreciate the conversations that I've had with everyone from administration, faculty, staff, friends, board trustees. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for this honor to be with you all. Now, I am going to share my screen and share a little bit of a PowerPoint with you all just to help me through because I talk and essentially this lectureship is just me talking. You'll notice that I don't have any notes and I just kind of go. So that's what we're going to do, all right? Oh, and I walk, but I'll make sure I keep my voice loud because for some apparent reason, I don't have a problem being loud. So <laughs> I will make sure I stay loud for you all. Now, I always open up with friends. May God be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for life. We thank you for health. We thank you for strength. God, we ask that you continue to be in the midst of this conversation, this esteemed lectureship. I'm still pinching myself, God, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you for bringing us safely to United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities. Thank you for the hospitality. Thank you for the love. Thank you for the laughter, and thank you for the conversation. And now, even as we delve into biblical studies and Galatians more specifically, we say thank you for what our eyes will see, our ears ears will hear what our hearts will feel and God right now we declare and decree that after this this session this time we can walk away from here and say did not our hearts burn with how the word of God was just opened up to us so we pray for that we declare it we decree it and we just say it right now in Jesus name we say thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus name I pray even as others may come to you by the name that you have revealed yourself to them amen Amen. All right, friends, so this evening I'm embarking on catching God's breath in the age of Black Lives Matter. Catching God's breath in the age of Black Lives Matter. And so you have to realize that I come to biblical studies with my entire full self behind me, meaning I don't just come as a rational brain who's gonna read and interrogate text and then tell students, this is how you have to interpret for all of time, all of eternity, until death do us part. This is, what, this is what the meaning of the text is. No, that's not me. Who I am is a womanist New Testament biblical scholar. A womanist New Testament biblical scholar. So even before I was womanist, I was daughter. Even before I was womanist, I was mother. Even before I was womanist, I was single mother, single divorced mother. Even before I was womanist, I was, yeah, those three things, because I became womanist and other things after the fact. So who I am and why I do what I do stems from these people behind me. So you're looking at the picture on the left, my dad and my son. My dad is a retired firefighter. My son is a firefighter in the Raleigh Fire Department. And so they are standing in their firefighter uniforms. And then right there in the middle, you see me with my husband, Victor. Now, Victor is my second husband because I've already disclosed to you that I was a single parent, divorced parent. And you have to realize, so think about this. Black woman raising children by herself, you know what it's like out there. Don't act new on me. <laughs> Y'all know what it's like out there. And we're like, eh. You get married one time and you're like, okay, I'm not doing that again. It didn't take. And then along comes Victor Parker, who in a lecture that I gave last week, I said, actually redeemed men for me. Oh. Yeah, see? <laughs> see? That's a lot, but I didn't even realize that I needed men to be redeemed for me until after it happens. And you're like, oh my God, that just happened. Hallelujah, thank the Lord. Why, God, why? But thank you, God, thank you. Because God knew that whatever man I married had to be okay with blah, 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 because I talk a lot. <laughs> and 
also that for the month of October, she just may not be home. You know? <laughs> but it's funny, because this is what my dad will say. My dad will say, you're leaving Victor again? Is he going to be OK? <laughs> I'm like, Dad, Victor cooks better than me. Am I going to be OK? <laughs> So that's Victor. But then you also see on the right, you're right, my daughter Ebony. My daughter who is the mother of this munchkin right here, Essence, and my son is the father of this munchkin right here who I told the faculty, you know, you get the same thing over and over again. My son was a rambunctious little boy. My grandson is a rambunctious little boy, and I was visiting over the summer, and he took to going to the top of the stairs as I was walking down the stairs, and then flinging his body on, this, over, on the stairs onto my back. And I'm just like, oh, okay, I got you. More piggyback rides, more piggyback rides. I never slept so well on a plane after leaving those children. <laughs> And then you have my mother, my mother in her fur coats. My mother is right here. And I love this picture of my mother in her fur coat because think about it. Before fur became evil, according to PETA, you know, you had white women sporting fur coats all the time and black women who never had the opportunity to buy fur coats. And so when my mother was finally able to buy a fur coat and now it's out of style because, you know, it's fur, She's like, I'm still wearing my fur coat. <laughs> so again, you know, culture and the people that you're with and your life experiences and who, how they frame you and shape you, that's all a part of being womanist for me. Because I met Victor at Shaw University. And at Shaw University, I did not know about womanism yet. And you have to realize, I am at Shaw, I go to the bookstore, and I see this book with the blue cover on it and entitled Sisters in the Wilderness, oh. right? And so I didn't buy it yet. I start reading it. Now, as I'm reading it, I kind of slide down the wall and just start reading this book. I'm not going to slide down right here. <laughs> yeah, I can't get up. <laughs> like, Kyle, come get me up. <laughs> reading this book and I start weeping because I'm like oh, there's a name for what I am there's a name for what I am and I did not even know I needed that name and so because of Dolores Williams's Dolores Williams work I'm like I'm womanist and I got it honest my mama born and raised in Alabama so Southern black woman who would look at me and say, girl, you talking too much. Girl, you doing the most. Girl, go sit your tail down somewhere. Girl, why you always asking questions? Hush, hush, hush. Because in my own way, I was already womanish by asking, why come? Why come I can't go outside and do this? Why come I can't do that? Why come? Not how come. Why come? All right. <laughs> and so I realized that I was womanish from Jump Street. So I have to lift up the work of uh, Dolores Williams or Renita Weems. Oh, wait, I thought I had that other slide. I took that slide out? How is that even possible? Sorry, I had the pictures of all the womanists. I was trying to be economical with time because I know I can talk. So I had their pictures. I have to realize and always convey that I'm on the shoulders of a Renita Weems. I'm on the shoulders of a Dolores Williams. I'm on the shoulders of a Mitzi Smith, who uh, two years ago invited myself and Erica Dunbar to be a part of the editing team of Bitter the Chastening Rod. I'm on the shoulders of a Gay Byron and a Vanessa Lovelace who put forth womanist interpretations of the Bible. I am on the shoulders of, of Wilda Gaffney and womanist Midrash and how she talks about inter interpretation and translation. So all of those folks are a part of who I am as a womanist New Testament scholar. And so I always have to lift those up and lift up these titles to say, read womanist, get some of these books and put them in your library and make sure that you engage womanist thought so that you have alternative ways of reading biblical text. And so with that said, let me say this about womanism as well. You know, I constantly, 
tell students that I read the Bible with the real lived experiences of black women in my head. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not niche, it's important. Because if the least of the world, if we actually pay attention to the least of the world, or as, as um, Zora Neale Hurston calls black women the mules of the world, if you, if you lift up those, then you're actually gonna lift up a lot more other people. If you take care and pay attention to black maternal health, then you're going to help white maternal health. But that doesn't mean you can't, you, you, know, you can't ignore black maternal health. That means you have to look at it and think about how you're rising and raising everyone up if you actually help those who are harmed more, most by the systems. So when I talk about being a womanist, I'm talking about loving myself and understanding my own radical subjectivity. I talk about actually thinking about community and communalism, whereas you know, there's that expression of, if I'm walking to Canada, I'm not walking to Canada by myself. I'm taking mommy, daddy, uncle, auntie, everyone that you saw in the pictures with me, because freedom by myself is not freedom at all. Freedom means that even my good, best white male friends are getting some liberation in the midst of me talking about womanist New Testament biblical interpretation. Yes! <laughs> I'm a Baptist preacher at heart, so you know that's gonna come out no matter what. <laughs> you know, there's a fine line between lectureship and Baptist preacher, and also stand-up comic as well. You know, I'm trying to do all three at the same time. <laughs> so I think that liberation is for all of us and I actually believe that and I think that the biblical text bears that out as well but then also I realized that I am critically engaged with both black liberation theologians and white feminists as well now don't get mad at me when I say white feminists see this is where I get in trouble <laughs> I talk about white feminism, and there's still sometimes groups of folks who have a hard time with people calling themselves white feminists. Because there's this belief in some circles that feminism should encompass all women, and technically it should, but we know it does not. We know that feminism was fighting with feminism when the um, right to vote was coming up. That white women were lobbying for white women to vote and were actually pushing black women to the side. So you have to have that historical conversation that says, well, was feminism really all for all women? Actually, no, it was really for middle class white women. So don't get mad when we say that just know that we're thinking historically about how feminism came, came about. So that's one reason why I, I call myself womanist instead of black feminist. Now, I don't get upset with my sisters who call themselves black feminists. The point is, you name you. You do you, I'll do me. Sometimes we come together and agree, sometimes we fight like hell, and then we just kind of say, okay, it's gonna be all right, you're still wrong, but I love you, you know? <laughs> These tenets of womanism are a part of me, all right? And I think there's one more. I named three, what's the fourth one? I talked about radical subjectivity, I talked about traditional communalism, I talked about critical engagement. <sighs> Loving the struggle. I'm still alive, so I still have hope. I'm still alive, so I'm still fighting. I'm still alive, but sometimes, you know, you get knocked down a few times that you got to go and tap out and tap a sister in to continue the fight. So you tap a sister in that while you're resting, and then she comes out, she taps you back in, you go and do the fight. Yep. Taking care of ourselves. A lot of us die too young out here in these academic streets, and we're not supposed to be dying young out here in these academic streets, and I'm declaring and decreeing over myself that we will not allow that to happen anymore. No more. There's still so much work to do. So that's a word about womanism. Now, here's where it's going to get fun. In your mind, do not say it out loud, the only good blank is a dead blank. The only good blank is a dead blank.
Don't say any bad words. But did you think of anything? Shout something out to me, please. The only good blank is a dead blank, but no bad words. <laughs> the only good snake is a dead snake. <laughs> That's a good one. I also got the only good spider is a dead spider. <laughs> Anything else, though? Think historically. The only good Native American is a dead Native American. Right. Or the only good N-word is a dead N-word. Or the only good F-word is a dead F-word. Yeah, think about Matthew Shepard. So historically, we've lived on a land where folks have espoused that ideology and it hasn't gone away. It may have shifted and changed and reformed a little bit. And so it's not necessarily all the time killing, even though it's still killing. Think about our police system. Well, he started to run, so. And then the, the tapes and the private conversations that we hear of we're gonna kill some and words today. We still hear this because this is still a mentality that is happening in today's day and age. So what does that all have to do with Bible? I'm so glad you asked. You're so smart. <laughs> what you are looking at is a replication of the dying gall. Let me get this out of here. Sorry. Okay. A replication of what is called the dying gall or the dying Galatian. So oftentimes, I'm teaching New Testament, and you have a, a New Testament textbook. Think good old Luke Timothy Johnson, if you all know Luke Timothy Johnson. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so they're like, oh, we remember that textbook. Oh, the trauma of seminary. <laughs> Y'all are so dramatic. Stop. So I remember reading a Luke Timothy Johnson textbook, because I assigned it in my first few years of teaching. And he had this replica of the dying Gaul, dying Galatian, in his Galatians part. But there was never an explanation as to why the dying Gaul or the dying Galatian was even in his textbook. Oh, if he's watching this, I know you're retired. I'm so sorry. <laughs> not, not, no, not, <laughs> not, not really. But I, you know, I try to be deferential sometimes. It just never, it never sticks. You know, it's like, I go a little bit. I'm like, eh, I'm taking it back. <laughs> and so you see this replica over and over again in textbooks. And what was, has been interesting for my work is, what does that actually mean when you read Galatians? Well, I think it means this. The only good Galatian is a dead Galatian. So you're reading mail that Paul has written to a group of people who have an inferiority complex, who have an identity crisis, who live in a world where because they beat Rome at war one time, and Rome will never ever allow them to rise up again and win, Rome has to commission propaganda that puts forth the idea that the only good Galatian is a dying Galatian, hence the dying Gaul, or the suicidal Gaul, who's killing himself and killing his wife in the midst of war. So what happens when a group of people begin to live into that propaganda that is given to them by oppressors. And what does it mean for today's contemporary Christian good folk, sarcastically she said, to actually walk with that group of people today? My argument is that I hope we all make it home. And I'm gonna change this and share the screen so it can be bigger. 
because in chapter four of my book, I actually say, close the book and listen to this song. And that's what we're gonna do right now. That doesn't subside This for the nappy heads in heaven With a nappy head Christ by their side I pray you catch a wave That doesn't subside This for the nappy heads in heaven With a nappy head Christ by their side Yeah May your streets be paved with gold Yeah Hope my whole hood make it home. Yeah. May your streets be paved with gold. Yeah. Hope my whole hood make it home. Yeah. Cause the world can be toxic. Especially when your skin look like chocolate. At one point they sold us for profit. But we made it out of the godly we chose it. Oh, my mama, the south side still holding. Yeah. Go for broke for the ones that are broken. Yeah. Please don't make me no hashtag or slogan. My whole hood is golden. That's why I pray you catch a wave. That doesn't subside. This for the nappy heads in heaven. With a nappy head, Christ by their side, I pray you catch a wave. The dozen subside, this for the nappy heads in heaven. With a nappy head, Christ by their side, yeah. May your streets be paved with gold. Paved with yeah. gold. Hope my whole hood make it home. Your streets be paved with gold. Paved yeah. with gold. Hope my whole hood make it home. Yeah. Cause they riding with choppers. It might turn your taper to pasta. Don't hardly see daughters at altars. Probably cause there ain't no more fathers. They stole them. Yeah. Put in cages by racist patrolling. Yeah. The hood is a lane to the pins like we bowling. Yeah. Please don't make us no hashtags or slogans. Yeah. Black people are golden. That's why I pray you catch a wave. That doesn't subside. This for the nappy heads in heaven. With a nappy head, Christ by their side. I pray you catch a wave. The dozen subside, this for the nappy heads in heaven. With a nappy head, Christ by their side. Yeah. May your streets be paved with streets gold. Streets be paved yeah. with gold. Hope my whole hood make it home. Hope you make it home. Yeah. May your streets be paved with gold. Streets I hope you make it home. 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 surreal about playing Make It Home and seeing George Floyd's name in this city. (sighs) 
racist patrolling, daughters not at altars because they stole black fathers. Just think about that. George Floyd has a daughter. I'm thinking about Philando Castile. I'm thinking about his girlfriend Diamond and the baby in the patrol car, four year old, two or four year old daughter saying, Mommy, mommy, be quiet. I don't want them to shoot at you too. Little babies seeing fathers taken away, trying to keep mothers calm. This is not the land of the free and the home of the brave. It's only land of free and home of brave for a particular group of people. And as I read biblical texts, I'm, sp I'm supposed to ignore all that? I'm supposed to ignore that and give people, just give people the plain literal word of the text. <laughs> plain literal word of the text that you don't even understand what you're reading because first of all, you're reading an English translation and you think that is inerrant and infallible. That is not applicable to an English translation. And so because we don't talk enough about these things, people don't know. And so my job is to make people know. So what am I getting at? Just as Toby and Wigwe is talking about, I pray you catch a wave, I'm praying that we catch God's breath. I'm praying that we catch God's breath and we realize that this is our attempt to breathe in deeply the God-breathed biblical text without doctrine, doctrines of inerrancy and infallibility choking our breath. So we are catching God's breath by holding the idea of scripture as authoritative because guess what? I still love the Bible. Even when I read some parts that say, oh, oh, this is funny. Women should learn in silence and not say anything, you know, in church. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, no, that's not Paul. And even if it is Paul, no, nope, uh -uh, that's not going to work for me. <laughs> because in my early life, I was really praying to God to take away my gifts. Really. Wrestling with those texts, I got angry and I said, God, why the hell did you give me these gifts if I'm not supposed to use them? And I did say that. Why the hell? Sometimes you got to curse and rail at God. I didn't say anything too bad, you know. I actually preached a sermon, all hell no. I thought it went over well. I probably had some people clutching their pearls, but they'll be okay. You know. <laughs> but why? So explain to me, God. Explain to me why my church can recognize my preaching skills, my church can recognize my teaching skills. Explain to me this and why then I'm not supposed to use it. Holy Spirit whispered to me, don't let your gifts fall into the grave. Uh, you have to realize at that time, I'm an abused woman. So being killed was always kind of close. This is not a perspective that you're going to get from most white male biblical scholars. So I read the text and I hear that in the Holy Spirit and I'm like, okay, we're, well, we're just going to keep going, you know? And so I got to the point in my life where I said, so now this means I don't have time to argue with people who are trying to say, you know, women can't preach, teach, do everything, senior pastor, do all that stuff. We ain't got time for that. Just let those folks go, all right? So that's the first word. But the point is, we're catching God's breath by holding the idea of scripture as authoritative while interrogating these doctrines of inerrancy and infallibility as tools of white supremacist thought that promote the erasure of communal memory. In this, we are all trying to make it home. So, Think about this. And now this is how I started with the Galatian people, the dying Gauls or the dying Galatians. They have a communal memory of being 
the folks that the only good gall is a dying gall. So my thesis for tonight, or my thesis just in general, I think, well, maybe for tonight, maybe in general, communal memory in Galatians has been erased. A womanist reading of Galatians engages a segment of society who possess an inferiority complex because of what society has told them about themselves. So Paul is writing to a group of people who, you know, think about how we've learned Galatians in the past. Actually, let me go there. Think about how we've learned Galatians in the past. We've learned about Galatians as this is the text that, you know, we get justification by faith in Christ. That's the most important thing of Galatians. Or you get this to the idea of, you know, those silly Galatians were trying to do, keep kosher, become circumcised, keep holidays. They were trying to become Jewish. Those silly, stupid Galatians. And Paul actually says that in Galatians 3. Oh, stupid Galatians. And so we read that and we say, well, Paul must have got it all right. Paul didn't get it all right. Okay, that's the first thing. <laughs> Paul didn't get it all right. But traditionally, we take that up and we say, okay, so then the most important thing, the kernel of truth that we have to hold on to in Galatians is justification by faith in Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. Or, you know, spirit over the law. Law now is bad and spirit is good. And if those foolish Galatians had just realized that, they would have held on to the better thing of the spirit. Or we talk about, you know, spirit realizes what the law cannot. So spirit is now over, is a binary over law. So you get these dualisms in Galatians that we hold on to as good traditional interpretations of Galatians. But what does that do? It actually sets us up for the problems of traditional interpretations, the problems of an errant and infallible views of interpretation so that when you question that, people get mad at you and say, that's not what the text means. And I'm like, well, how do you know what the text means? Were you there back? Were you the Galatians receiving the letter? Huh? No. That's what's often been ignored. So that's why I talk about the Luke Timothy Johnson textbook. That's what's been ignored. So what happens? Folks read Galatians and they get this anti-Semitic thought that leads to white Christian supremacy. How does that happen? It happens because now you get Jewish people over against Christian people in traditional interpretations of Galatians. So the Christians become the good folks, Jewish people become the bad folks, Paul is the hero, and he's, he's talking to those stupid Galatians about not, not becoming Jewish. You're just all one in Christ. Okay, seems good. It seems good in theory, but based on, it's based on a Jewish Christian binaryism that limits God's breath in our lives. And how does it do that? It does that by setting up this dichotomy. What you are looking at is a, a window staining from the church, St. John's Church in Verben, Germany. And the title of this window stain is Ecclesia et Synagoga. Ecclesia, meaning church, synagogue, meaning synagogue, all right? Now, the one thing I love about this painting is that we have a brown Jesus. We got a brown Jesus on the cross. I don't know what the Germans were thinking, <laughs> but it makes sense because Jesus was brown. Now, that's the other thing. Lord, I have a lecture entitled How Jesus and Paul Became White. And it's so funny because the students are like, oh. I'm like, oh, you really think they're white? You listen to Megan F Kelly who talks about, sorry, kids, Santa and Jesus are white. Wasn't that Megan Kelly? Am I going back too far? Fox News? I, I remember. Okay, see, thank you. I got one remembrance. <laughs> so, you know, I'm teaching those, those students who are, again, clutching their pearls, but really, no, they're crosses or whatever. They're clutching something. <laughs> When you look at the ecclesia section of this stained glass, what do you see? Dominance. Dominance. How so? Unpack a little bit more. Well, it was once again, they got banners flying over. 
Yeah, they're marching in. They got a banner. It's falling on over them. What's coming down from the sky? A hand. What is the hand doing? It's putting a, a, a crown on the head of the church. The hand of God is putting a crown on the head of the church. The church is riding in with the chalice of communion and riding with a cross and the banner, and it's riding on an animal that has four heads, a bear head, a lion head, an eagle head, and a face, a human face head. What does that signify? The four gospels, right, good. Now what do you see over here? Yeah, it's not a crown, is it? <laughs> you have a blindfolded synagogue. Blindfolded synagogue. The hand of God is doing what? Knocking the crown off with what? It's a sword. So God is doing the piercing or the killing of synagogue. God bless you. God is doing the piercing or the killing of synagogue. And synagogue is blindfolded, has a goat in its hand, and it's riding on a broken down donkey. This is a typical German interpretation of Galatians. And when I have to take German in my PhD program and read and translate German biblical scholars, guess what? That's how Christian supremacy gets seeped into me, and it's also how <laughs> becoming a white male biblical scholar gets seeped into me based on these interpretations that are replicated over and over and over again. So then what do we do? Because baked into the system is the idea of supersessionism, that idea that Christianity becomes better than Judaism. And so a synagogue shooting that's done by a man who's in a Presbyterian church is not abnormal, but it should be. I think one of the main things that I'm most concerned about is that students leave my classes and still have anti-Semitic thought in their heads. That's one thing that keeps me up at night. In addition to the rising white Christian nationalism that chants blood and soil, the Jews will not replace us in Charlottesville so we still keep replicating these ideas that are problematic in Christian thought, but for me specifically in biblical interpretation. So what happens? How do I get out of that? Let me go back because I think that's a better slide for how I get out of it. I read this text, and as what we'll do tonight, I read Galatians 1.1, and this is just touch points. 1, 1, 2, 15, and 16, and 6, 2 as touch points to help us understand a little bit about the identity of the Galatian people and put more meat on my argument that the propaganda put on them by Rome is behind their desire to actually become Jewish as they become one in Christ. And as they become Jewish and as they become one in Christ in their brain, they believe, I would argue, that because Judaism is an old religion in Roman imperial times and is an accepted religion in Roman imperial times, you almost get a comeuppance if you get close to Judaism. It's the same thing about if we can get close to whiteness. You know, yeah, think about that. The closer you get the whiteness, the more acceptable you are. I think that the Galatians were going through their own proximity to something a little bit better. So instead of reading them as, oh, stupid Galatians, I read them as people who are trying to work out their identity when so much of the propaganda against them has said you are nothing. How do you think black folk feel when so much of the propaganda against us has said we are nothing. Black folk, brown folk, 
who've been placed in systems that have been constructed to ensure that you're almost nothing. And then you say, oh, get saved and it'll be okay. Get your soul right. Because the only thing that matters is the soul. Again, that hierarchy of soul over what's actually happening in my body as the police beat me up or the police arrest me and place me in handcuffs. I talk about that in the book as well. A, a friend of mine said, you know, it's very emotional because you tell stories as if they're nothing. I'm like, well, I tell stories, but I still feel those bodily experiences. I still feel being handcuffed as a police officer is searching my minivan because I'm a black woman driving on a highway in North Carolina late at night because I was coming home from school, but she shouldn't have a minivan. Of course she's trafficking drugs. Multiple times. And I was not smart enough to say, no, you can't search my van. But they do that. So, of course, I have that bodily experience and that feeling of feeling less than or being profiled. And why wouldn't I bring it into reading the biblical text? Why wouldn't I? So, becoming a white male biblical scholar did not take. <laughs> and I read Galatians 1, 1, 2, 15 through 16 and 6, 2 in order to provide touch points that I hope leads us into a mature faith that challenges white supremacist doctrinal ideas of individual faith and transforms it into a communal understanding of being with the other through the idea of catching God's breath. So being with the other means that you don't gaslight your black mother friends who are Christians with you and say, oh, well, if he just you know, says, yes, sir, no, sir, and keeps his hands where they can see, he'll be okay. Don't gaslight us into doing that, into making us think that these aggressions are okay and it's just those other bad black boys and girls. No. What do they see when they see us? Coming into Seattle school one time, I get on the bus and a man who is in my neighborhood and getting on the bus, I go to the bus stop and he says, damn it, I hate all these in my neighborhood. All these N-words in my neighborhood. I have to go to school and teach. And I remember thinking, well, this is my neighborhood too because I live here. <laughs> The only thing that he saw when he saw me was a black woman, and he had felt like he had the right to get upset that this black woman, this N-word, is in his neighborhood. And so even though I'm preparing to be professor and go teach a Greek class, I'm already profiled into something else because he doesn't know me. And the same things are still happening over and over again. I like going places sometimes where I, people don't know me, just so I can see how they react. You know, because sometimes they're like, oh, I didn't know you were somebody. <laughs> well, I should already be somebody anyway. Yeah. Well, and that's how we should look at all folks, that all folks are somebody. And that's the problem that we're having today. So, catching God's breath means that we are looking at folks already as somebody and trying to walk along with them so that they all make it home. All right. You're looking at Galatians 1, 1, well, 1 through 5 in Greek text. So essentially you have Paul saying, Paul, an apostle, not of humanity or not of by a human person, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, the one raising him, ek nekron, the one raising him from the dead is your normal translation. But if you're a Greek student with me, you know that nekron is masculine plural genitive. So if you had to translate that plurally, I would coach students to translate not just from the dead, but from the dead ones. From the dead ones. So let me ask you this. When you think about Jesus being raised from the dead, 
What's the vision that's always painted in your brain? And this is where you can talk. <laughs> Jesus getting up. What? Say it again. In the grave. Okay, he's in the grave. Jesus getting up. The tomb getting moved away or some, somehow the stone being rolled away by a mighty earthquake maybe. All right, any others? There is, a, I want to say a Buddhist idea of Jesus being raised from a multiplicity of dead ones. So Western culture, we highlight the abstract idea of Jesus being raised from the dead. Like he is being raised from that state of being dead and now he is alive. I like to see it as Jesus being pulled out by all those other dead ones that have been killed by crucifixion that the Roman Empire has put to death because the Roman Empire don't like people who talk too much, think too much, say too much, do too much. And they kill them as insurrectors or insurrectionists or something, some kind of word like that. So if you're the Galatian people and you know that you are the group of people that's considered the only good Galatian is a dying Galatian, and the first line that Paul writes to you is that Jesus, the one being raised from the dead ones, can you imagine a Galatian Holy Ghost shout? Because they're, they're, they are, they're getting that, oh my goodness, we are the dead ones that Jesus is being raised from. All of our ancestors who have died, Jesus is coming from them. See, we already miss it at Galatians 1.1. It would have been a Holy Ghost shout from the Galatian people because this is their mentality. And Jesus is getting God's breath by being raised by God the Father out of the multiplicity of dead people. That's just Galatians 1.1 right there. And then you get the rest of it that he's coming to, you know, for that, that present evil age to get us all out. And that's about as nice as Paul gets <laughs> when he writes this letter. Because usually when he writes a letter, he says, uh, like, Eucharisto, I thank my God, Eucharisto, Eucharisto, mu theu, I give thanks to my God, something like that. No, actually, moi theoi. I give thanks to my God for you all. The next line after five is, I marvel that you've already so turned away. <laughs> He's just angry at them, all right? But moving on, because I realize I'm talking a way long time. So by the time we get from 1-1 to 2-16, you get that, that thing that we kind of hang our hats on, that we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but by faith, through, by faith in through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law because no one will be justified by the works of the law. So what happens before at 2.11 is that Paul says he had to kind of like resist Peter to his face. And he calls him Kephas. I think when Paul's angry at Peter, he calls him Kephas. I think he calls him out by his Aramaic name. He won't call him by his Greek name. Yeah, he does. He, it, is shady as hell, y'all. <laughs> Paul is shady. I don't understand how we miss Paul's shadiness. Earlier, he talks about, yeah, I went to Jerusalem, and I saw, you know, James, John, and Peter, but they didn't add anything to me. We just, you know, we said that we would give to the poor, and then Mark Barnabas and I went on our way. He really downplays them because he says, the supposed pillars of the church. And a lot of times, the translators won't want to put the supposed pillars of the church. Yeah, it's fascinating to read. Paul is shady. So he's having this argument with Peter, and then he gets into this, we ourselves are Jew by birth. And then, so we hold on, we forget all of Paul's shadiness, and we hold on to this concept of justification by faith. In Christ. Now, what's happening now is that a lot of your translations, your UNRSV hyphen V-U-E is changing the translation. It's saying that instead of, now I'm just going verse 16, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law only or except through the faith of Jesus Christ. So that's that bold section right here. The Pisteos Iesu Christu. 
the faith of Jesus Christ. And then in the middle, and we believe, in, in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified out of the faith of Christ. So in my book, I talk about a subjective genitive and a, and a and blah, 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 blah. An objective gen gen genitive. <laughs> and so here's my question for you. If, what does it mean if we say not through the faith in Jesus Christ, but a man is justified through the faith of Jesus Christ, and we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. What is that faith of Christ? What could that faith of Christ be alluding to? And you can shout out. <laughs> Y'all are like, this is an interactive lecture. <laughs> faith of Christ. What do you think that entails? Yes, Jesus' faithfulness or the faith that Jesus has. Okay, what could possibly be the faith? What would Jesus have to have faith in? Himself or, <laughs> himself or the people around him. What did verse 1-1 one, one say? God, God did what? Raised him from the dead ones. I argue that Jesus' faith is the faith that says, you know what? I got to walk in such a way that I'm knowing I'm walking myself unto death. And if I'm walking myself unto death, I have to have the faith that God is going to raise me from the dead ones. So my question becomes, how do we walk in a faith that we know we're about to get ourselves killed, but we walk with such a faith that Jesus had, that we walk in such a way where we know we're going to get ourselves killed, but God is going to raise us from the dead, from the dead ones. That's a different kind of faith walk than the take Jesus track out of my pocket at the supermarket and give it to the woman in front of me and ask her, have you heard about Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Would you like to be saved today? <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> There's something very different about this faith walk. So I argue that Jesus has the faith that believes that God is going to raise him. And so he's walking in such a way that he's actually going to make it home with other people. Think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's talking to the disciples and he's saying, stay awake with me and pray with me on this night before all hell is going to go down. And the disciples keep falling asleep. That's it. Can you stay awake with somebody as they're going through? Can you be with somebody as they're going through those dark moments of their time? Can you walk and be with someone as they're bearing their child that's been struck by police violence and you say, well, God had a better plan. Or God needed to pluck the prettiest flower that's a lie from hell. That's not good theology, and that's not how we sit well with people. So how do we walk with folks with this faith of Jesus? Because our spiritual houses have been built on sand. Meaning, I love Paul, but Paul uses some language where he talks about himself as a birthing mother and he talks about himself as a slave for Christ. And we think of it as all metaphorical terms, which is okay. But as you see from my reading, I'm actually thinking about what happens to actual bodies in the text. Not just Paul, but the other people around the text. The people who have been receiving the letters. How would they have received it? So when I think about Paul and I think about the Galatian people, you have to realize that their empire... Roman Empire is built on the oppression of groups of people. So this is the Gemma Augustea. It's a, about a nine-inch um, onyx stone carved with this scene. So the scene, the top scene, has, you know, coronation of Caesar Augustus and all the people at the top. 
but it's built on the people of the bottom, those Galatian people who are bound and gagged, who are about to suffer rape or molestation, who are being pulled by their hair while trying to hold up their clothes, who, you know, the Romans are erecting a trophy because they've conquered the people. Again, the only good Gaul is a dying Gaul. And so then how do we understand this text, thinking about the imagery as text, because think about it, the, the Roman and Jewish and Galatian and people of Ephesus, they would have been inundated with all of the Roman imperial ideology around them. They're not just reading the text in isolation. They're reading the text with, with statues and buildings and particular architecture that they live in that shows them their place in society. We're still living with that today. Things that show us our place in society or as Titus Kafar is arguing, he's an um, artist that I would say look him up and look at his works and imagine, he's saying, what do, how do we imagine actually bringing those oppressed people to the forefront? Think about our founding fathers, good men. Of course, Thomas Jefferson didn't rape Sally Hemings. She was his mistress. How the heck you gonna be someone's mistress? You have no time for consent. So uncovering all that and realizing that the, the spiritual lies that we tell ourselves, oh, just become saved and everything will be okay. Don't worry about the oppression that you're constantly going through. Don't worry about the systems and structures that keep you enslaved or take away black fathers from black families because the prison industrial system is just now the new Jim Crow and the new enslaved system. Don't worry about all that. Just get saved and you'll be okay. And for a time period, that would have been my preaching. I would have been a preacher of personal responsibility. Now hear me well. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have personal responsibility. But I'm saying that's not the only thing that we should be telling people. And it's a lie from the pit of hell when governments try to invoke that personal responsibility on, on oppressed peoples as well. So... What does that mean? By the time you get to Galatians 6.2, after going through Galatians 3.28, where you, know, you have that wonderful passage that there's no longer Jew nor Gentile, male or free, slave or free, but we are all one in Christ. Does that mean all of our distinctions go away? No, there's still difference. But how do we work with that difference as we are in Christ? So that's one touch point. But now 6.2 says, Alelon tabare bastatsete kai utos anaplerosete tan naman tu Christu. Bear, well, really, it's Aleon. He, he, front, he fronts the one another. One another, you bear burdens. You know, so it's, what's most important is how you are with one another. We translate it, bear one another's burdens, but I love telling students that Greek writers front the most important word, and the most important word is one another. The most important word is one another. Bear one another's burdens, and thus you will fulfill the law of Christ. And it's fascinating because Paul doesn't say anything else about the law of Christ. This is one time saying it, but again, see, now this is what you begin to understand. The way that traditional interpretations have this binary of spirit over law, by the end, you get spirit, you get one another, you get law of Christ that kind of puts it all back together. And so I would argue that that binaryism has to go away. Loving one another has to become the law of the land. You get in Galatians 5, those beautiful fruits of the spirit those fruits of the spirit that, you know, we, we know justification, we know fruits of the spirit, but that's all we usually know about Galatians. <laughs> that's the truth. So here we, get, we can get to the, oh, by the end of it, we actually do love one another and we walk with one another in such a way that we, make each, that we all make it home. And so in the midst of this, I get my breath because actually, 
I can now see a little bit of my own identity in this text. I don't have to become Paul. I don't have to become Jesus. I can be who I am in Christ, African-American, fully embodied black woman, and still love God and want to walk with other people so that we make it home. Because by the time we're reading and we're trying to catch God's breath, we actually catch God's breath, I argue, when we participate in Jesus' faith. Jesus' faith that he had to believe that God would raise him from the dead, that God would back into his body, that God would, as he did with Ha-Adam in Genesis, that catching God's breath is us participating in Jesus' faith. This means that we expect God to breathe life back into us when we walk in such a way that we seemingly will get ourselves killed Nonetheless, we are all walking everyone home. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. And now I welcome your questions and comments. did about five minutes over. My apologies. <laughs> I always say, what's, what's kind of coming up for you all? Just going to walk around with a microphone if you have <laughs> questions after that wonderful presentation. Thank you, Dr. Parker. I just want to let you know um, yeah. the, the video, thank you for the video, because mm -hmm. yes. uh, I'm reading Teaching White Supremacy uh, by the um, the historian Yakovone and yes. uh, that first chapter, th the things that were said about uh, the formerly enslaved, I, I have to put that book down because it is the yeah. most horrible. Mm -hmm. So the, the juxtaposition of that video, um, especially the image of the nappy-headed Christ, yes. um, just, I want to talk a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk about that video, how you found it, and how that figures into that work? I just thought that was just, it, it, it really spoke to me because of the juxtaposition of what I've been reading and what you just showed me. Okay, good. So, I talk about how I was introduced to Toby and Nwigwe by my colleague, Shaniqua Walker Barnes. She preached in chapel at Mercer at McAfee School of Theology. And before she preached, she showed the video. And so I went down the rabbit hole of Tibi in Wigway with all of his music. And this one was the one that stuck for me as I was writing my final chapter in If God Still Breathes, because I equate bearing one another's burdens to helping us all make it home. And when I talk, when he talks about and sings about the nappy-headed Christ, you know, as I've said, I teach a Christ that is not white. And for so many students, there's still this ingrained idea of a white Jesus. There's the ingrained idea of a Jesus, you know, walking through your suburb with the sheep around his neck saying, you know, knocking on the door, let me in. You know, Jesus is at the door knocking. And that's just not an accurate portrayal of Jesus. And so we've grown up with these images and have never questioned, like for example, my, my granddaughter, we got into a heated argument. I'm arguing with the then six-year-old because she's talking about, I said, tell me the books that you're reading. She's like, well, I'm coloring this book and I have this book. And I'm like, well, Jesus is white. Yeah, grandma, Jesus is white. Jesus isn't white. <laughs> grandma, Jesus is too white. And I'm like, okay, I have so much rearranging to do and so much there's so much unraveling that needs to be done I have a colleague who's working on child's children's bibles and expanding children's bibles to be more inclusive and to show a more accurate portrayal of jesus and not just showing satan as black because that's what they do and so ingrained into children is this idea of white being good and black being bad and we have, to, we have to disavow them of that. So the nappy-headed Christ, it just hits home for me. Yeah, it just hits home for me. I hope that answered the question. Okay, good. 
Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I'm wandering over to Dr. Siglico. Uh, also, just to note the Zoomers, if you have a question, please post oh, a question yeah. Feel in free the chat. You can see it. Thanks so much for your, for your talk, thank you. Dr. Parker. Um, I have a question, I guess it's about breath yes. and life. I guess I've been thinking a lot about breath and perhaps that's because of the COVID-19 pandemic right. that, uh, mm -hmm. that attacks the lungs, but also, mm -hmm. you know, the, the last words of Eric Garner yes. and George Floyd was, I can't breathe and thinking mm -hmm. about, um, you know, the social forces of asphyxiation, mm -hmm. right? That, um, that, that, that get it at, at the lungs, that get it at the breath, I guess. I'm trying to think theologically, I guess, about life and breath and what, you're t what you said about the faith of Jesus and resurrection. And right. um, I'm not sure if you if you followed Ashil Mamembe's recent work, but uh, the African mm -hmm. philosopher, he's been talking about the universal right to breathe wow. as a kind of, um, a kind of call to the yeah, to, to a certain kind of universality that, that, mm -hmm. that um, and the struggle, the kind of the collective struggle for breath, which is, um, I don't know if that's really a question other than I'm, I'm just trying to think about what your thoughts are about breath and life and resurrection and the faith of Jesus and if you have any more yeah. reflections on that. Well, so one thing that I did not specifically talk about was the Greek term theopneustos which I translate instead of inspired by God, which is usually what occurs in um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, I like to translate it as God breathed. And so it seems to me that when you think about breath, I often think about Hebrew Bible ruach or, you know, God breathed, which is a, a penuma term as well. So theopneustos talks about breath. And it seems as though as humanity, we should have that right to breathe. We should have that right to living without having to hold our breaths. Or, you know, remember waiting to exhale back in the day, ladies? You know, just that movie of, you know, black women holding their breath. <gasps> Is he gonna come now? Is he gonna come now? And we're just, we're, we can't breathe, we're stifled. How many of us actually go through life often holding our breaths, waiting for the other shoe to drop, whatever that shoe may be, or waiting just for something bad to happen, not really living our full lives because we're, we're stifling our own breath. I think that God is sad when we don't breathe well. I really do, because think about it. It all started with God's breath in Ha Adam. And so COVID, has been a, a worldwide sadness for all of us because we've seen people. My daughter had COVID in January of 2021, and I was talking to her, and she was just, just couldn't breathe. As a mother, that broke my heart. It just seems to me as though for a number of years, we have just been ignoring some of the, the issues of, multiple issues of not being able to breathe. COVID, police violence, just every, all the bad things that have been happening. And I think I'll just end with my thought that God is sad when we can't breathe. Because think of, even about Jesus in John, I wanna say 21 or 22, and he says, receive you the Holy Spirit. And he breathes on the folks in John. And that's the only time we get that. But I love that passage. Because I think any time two or three are gathered, the wind of God should be in the midst. I think God's spirit just always wants to be in the midst and, and breathing on us. And, you know, just think about acts lighting on us like little bits of fire. And I think that gives God happiness. And so I still believe that God is still breathing through the text. We just have to take it in. Not really an answer, just my musings on breath. <laughs> Thank you. Others, others. My boss raised her hand. <laughs> Do 
Dr. Parker, I'm so interested, of course, in uh, this Pistu Christu, mm -hmm. uh, Richard Hayes, fine work on yes. uh, faith of mm -hmm. Christ rather than faith in. I'm wondering if the distinction there is more about incorporation, mm -hmm. the incorporative corporate Christology that it portends. Uh, yeah. Would you reflect on that for us? Yeah, sure. That's a great question because I, I talk about Hayes's work in this chapter and I frame it as participation with Christ because there, yeah, thank you. <laughs> And that's me following Hayes a little bit. That's me following Hayes and using the language, and Douglas Campbell, Hayes and Campbell, using the language of participation with Christ. Because I think it is participation with Christ. However, I want to kind of hone down a little bit and, and solidify the participation a little bit more. Because I think when I read their works, it could be, it can still be abstract participation with Christ. It's not an, a corporal or embodied participation with Christ. And so I think that part of our struggles in contemporary Christianity is we're not thinking about the walk of Jesus. You know, think about the, the creeds, creed, language of the creed. Hung, bled, and died, resurrected on the third day. So you get born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, hung, bled, and died, and I hope I'm doing creeds. I don't do creeds. So that's just what I'm remembering about creeds. But it's missing the walk, the touch, the, the, don't do that though. You know, spitting and putting mud on somebody's eyes. Please don't do that. We just had a black pastor do that. It was bad. <laughs> the, the actual being with people. You know, the being in the crowds and the, the bodies pressed against him. We don't get that in the creeds. We don't get the, you know, going and taking Jairus' daughter by the hand and saying, Talitha Kum, raise up, child. Or, you know, telling people he's not dead, he's just sleeping. Or she's not dead, she's just sleeping. Or we don't even get just the idea of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead and then the people wanting to kill Lazarus too. Because Jesus raised him from the dead and they just didn't want to kill Jesus. They were going to put Lazarus back in the grave. How absurd is that? So you're killing not just the charismatic male, but you're also killing the works of the charismatic male. So what am I talking about? Think about an MLK. Think about a, a, a Malcolm X and how when folks think that if you just strike the head, everything else is going to die. Well, no. If we actually participate in the walk with an MLK or in the walk with Jesus or in the walk with a ML, uh, uh, Malcolm X, that some of that has rubbed off on us. And so we become bodily like Jesus, not just head like Jesus. And I think Hayes and, and Campbell do good work, but I want to give it a little bit more body. And that's what I'm trying to do. Give the work a little bit more body. Yeah, thank you. Great question. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Dr. Angela, thank you so much. You. Um, as you were speaking and you were talking about the text and you were using Greek and English translations, mm -hmm. one of the things that kept rising out of my mind yes. was the head and heart connection. Mm. We read text through our intellect. Mm -hmm. And you were making us think what this experience could be like if we experienced it. Right. I thank you for that. Thank you. Here's thank a question. You. you turned the diamond on many sides tonight. Mm. Almost couldn't keep up with you. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> now I've got to go home and read, right? <laughs> what one or two takeaways do you want us to have as we leave because I heard you say together multiple times so it's like what is it that you want us to do together 
Like, I almost heard you, but not quite. So could you just be really directly clear for me? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> One or two takeaways directly. My biggest hope, my number one hope, is that your walk with Jesus becomes a more embodied walk that is communal. Because we still read text individually. And we read text and we see Paul writing something and saying you. And we read it as individual, common singular nominative in the language of Greek. Common singular nominative. But it's not common singular nominative. Paul, more than not, writes in common plural nominative. Meaning he's writing to collective you. He's not writing to individual yous. And so we've been trained to read our Bible as individual you and not as communal you. So first major takeaway is walking with Jesus in such a way that you recognize the communal you. Walking with Jesus in such a way, number two, that the communal you is walking with so many groups of people that all these groups of people actually make it home safely. Meaning, the metaphor of making it home is, how do we engage policy, policy makers, governmental structures, and even ecclesial structures in such a way that we actually take care of one another? I live in the state of Georgia. We have, in case you haven't heard, <laughs> you have a Raphael Warnock and you have a Herschel Walker. I hear Christians say, I want Herschel Walker to win because he will vote in a way that is good for me. Christians, in my classes, and I have to keep a straight face. That's the individualistic Christian looking at Herschel Walker saying, he'll keep my stat, stock right. I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking. I really don't know. Versus a Raphael Warnock in the lineage of Cone, James Cone, God of the oppressed. In the lineage of an MLK pastoring Ebenezer Baptist Church, in the lineage of thinking about more people than just I and me, but we're living in a world where Christians are thinking about me, 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 because they're not reading the text, text, text. <laughs> or people are not expounding the text to them in really good whole ways. That's the problem too. Because people go to seminary and then forget it when they get back because they want to keep their job. Now, I understand that. I understand that. And so one thing I often tell students is, yeah, you have to have a job, but you can't just let them run roughshod, roughshod over you and tell you how to preach and how to teach. Because you actually did go to school to learn something and to help people be better. So I think those are the two things, because it's not just about your own individual faith in Christ, but it's about how we walk with the faith of Christ with one another so that we can do what I hear a lot in this building, good social transformation. Social transformation is for everybody. It's not just for me, 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 me. So I think those are the two takeaways. Was that helpful? Okay, good. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and then there's one back there. Dr. Parker, thank yes. you. Thank you. I would love to hear further exposition on how Galatians, or how not Galatians, how not, 
how reading Galatians doesn't become supersessionist or anti-Semitic, yeah. and particularly in Galatians 6, where Paul talks about the law of Christ. Right, right. I think Paul is reframing the law, and he's reframing the law, I don't think to say that, you know, the law was all bad, because I think you also have to read Galatians with Romans, and I like reading Galatians with Romans 9 through chapters 9 through 11 because one thing that we get from Paul is that Paul is writing over an extended period of time. So I know Dr. Marshall has done a commentary on 1 Thessalonians. I always start with 1 Thessalonians because it seems to be Paul's earliest work. And in that work, he's very derogatory to Jewish folks. So in 1 Thessalonians, it seems like he's being anti-Semitic against his own people. And then as time goes on, and I often read Paul as revising and changing his mind over the years, because at first he think, he's thinking Jesus is coming back immediately, and then he's not coming back immediately, so he has to reframe and talk to these communities and talk about, you know, how do we live now in this in-between time? And so by the time you get to Romans, and he asks at Romans 9, what about the Jews? And he kind of leaves us with this, well, you know, they're, they're part of the, the tree. He uses this great olive branch or olive tree metaphor, that they're, they're part of it. And so it seems to me that we have to actually read Paul better so that we don't land on anti-Semitism. That you read Paul in, I like to read Paul chronologically, and as you read him, you, you talk about how he's wrestling with his thought, he's wrestling with his ideas, and it's not, this, this, this gets away of the, you know, the Bible coming down from heaven to us fully formed. Yeah, because you have to, you have to give people, people have so many ideas about the Bible, and so if you actually talk about, you know, Paul changing mind, shifting gears, changing over years, I think that helps to at least begin to address it. People were, are still going to read Paul and still try to hold up anti-Semitism because for some reason people want to be better than other people. Yeah. And so they, they will still try to do that. Great question. Thank you. I think we are, excuse me, right at nine o'clock. Okay. And this was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Parker. I think that Henry Gustafson wouldn't have known what had hit us. <laughs> Uh, and I think it's just absolutely wonderful uh, to carry forward good scholarship that incites good thinking. And we're so grateful that you have been with us tonight. Thank you so yeah. much. I've enjoyed it immensely. Uh, we'll talk about First Thessalonians later. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thank you. It's wonderful to sit at the feet of a scholar. And I can imagine that you make the classroom dance. Uh, yeah, indeed. We'll receive uh, a Pauline benediction. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>